So welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. I'm here today joined by the one and only Frederick Raphael, who has worked with the likes of John Schlesinger, um, Stanley Kubrick. You know, the list goes on. Mazursky as well, right? That was one of your last uh, collaborations. Which was? With um, with uh, um, Kubrick? No, no, with uh, Mazursky. Um Oh, Mazursky, yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I've forgotten that. It was coast to coast. <laughs> right, coast to coast. He did a very he did a very nice job. Um, and I think he was very disappointed that it wasn't sent to the movie houses. It went straight to television. Right, right, right. So 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 what I want to do is kind of you take know the back. story about Mazursky, don't you? No, no, I'd love to hear it. I do not. Well, I do not. Mazursky's original first name, I'm not I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a distinctly Jewish name, mm. uh, whatever it was. Say it was Alphonse Mazursky. <laughs> and his friend said to him, if you want to be a success as an actor, which he did to begin with, you really ought to change your name in the same way that all kinds of people did when they went to Hollywood. So he said, okay, I'll do that. So he came back and they said, what have you changed it to? And he said, Paul Mazursky which wasn't exactly what they had in mind because the Mazursky <laughs> was what gave him away. He was he was very smart. Right. Paul Mazursky. So what was his original name? I'm sorry? What was his original name? What did he change it from? I don't know. The, the original name was Mazursky, but it wasn't right. Paul. Oh, right, right, right. Well, so I don't know what it, what, what it was before. What they wanted him to change was the last name, not the first name. His friends thought he should change the last name, <laughs> right. but he didn't want to do that. Right. So so when when did you, and your career has obviously spanned many, many generations, and you've seen it all. You've seen it all from like the sort of the early days of cinema to, you know, to your last collaborations. How did you get involved as a young man into wanting to become a writer? A writer? Yes. A writer is quite different from what I did in the movies, in, oh. in the sense that I never thought of having anything to do with the movies. In those days, it was very unsmart. In mm -hmm. England in particular, which is where I happened to be, uh, to work in the movies, my main inspiration was an English writer called uh, William Somerset Maugham, mm. who is still pretty well known, though I talked to my daughter-in-law, who went to Oxford, and she'd never heard of him. So that's what fame does for you. <laughs> but he taught me how to look and listen. And not invention wasn't his strength. I mean, I think I'm, perhaps I invent more than he did. Mm. But the great thing as a writer is not to talk too much, but to listen. That's interesting. And, and could you elaborate on that a little bit in a more sort of practical um, sort of implementation sense? I'm sorry. So can can you elaborate on that concept a little bit? Because I myself am a writer of sorts, you know, as in I've, you know, uh, I've, I've spent the time to create screenplays, whether they're yes. long or short. Yes. I've been able I mean, to produce what, a few what, of my what, own. Like God, the, the, the sacredness of being a novelist or a poet, which I've never claimed to be, is that nobody... Nobody can influence what you write if you don't want them to. There are plenty of cowards who give in, plenty of people who watch the market carefully. But my vision of being a writer is to speak for yourself or to hell with them all. Mm. I had a lot more luck in terms of money and success in the movies than I ever wished to. Um, mm. I did write a play very early on, which led me to be involved with a man called Leslie Brickus. Have you ever heard of Leslie Brickus? I have not. I have not. No, yeah, well, that's what fame does for you. <laughs> he was a very successful uh, musical comedy writer and songwriter, and he wrote he wrote the song for Goldfinger, you remember the... Um, oh, of course. The that, for... that, you know, that and, I remember. Leslie, Leslie knew his way around in show business, which I did not. Uh, I, I've always been more of a prig than an opportunist, um, and I wouldn't want to change that. What, what's but, that term? I'm not familiar with that term, prig. That, I'm sorry? Really, what's, what, what's that term, prig? I'm not familiar with that term. A prig? Yeah. 
a prig is somebody who's pretty stuck up, you know. Oh, I see. Uh, I I would. I don't mean that I want you to call me that. <laughs> right, right. But uh, I, it's rather like being a Jew. You can call yourself a Jew, but you don't want other people to do it all that much, particularly sure. if they're not Jewish. Um, now, what I mean is that my vision of life was to be a writer and to tell, as far as I knew, and in limited terms, the truth mm. about things, and to hell with them all. And my first English publisher thought I was going to be a nice English writer of funny books. And as soon as I wasn't, uh, they sat, they got rid of me very nicely because they said, nobody is going to like you if you write the kind of book which my second book, The Olsen Way, illustrated. And I, I suppose I was lucky enough to be with a woman, as I still am, who loved me, to be indifferent to whether other people like me or not. Mm. That's a gift. Of course, I'm not really indifferent at all. But <laughs> right, right, right. But that's what fame does for you. Uh, right. <laughs> Which is a great catchphrase, by the way. Um, I'm going to probably use that now for the next year and a half, and we've only spoken for 10 minutes or six minutes. Um, so, 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 so I'm sorry. So, so, um, you were speaking about this gentleman that that you met um, who was working, uh, who did the Goldfinger song, and uh, you were kind of telling me a little bit about your your beginnings, right? How you go from your publishers thinking that you're going to be a, a nice, funny writer to you actually, you know, winning an Academy Award, right? For, um, you know, for your work with John Schlesinger. So how, how, how did that sort of evolve from you? Well, I, I, luck. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, that's one of the things you, that, that great uh, uh, American photographer uh, whose name I've now forgotten, because it'll come back to me, um, said, you know, luck is what determines things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that everything you do is luck. Now, what happened was that I, in England, television came in in 1960 in a big way. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the sort of, by fortune, I had a book that came out at that time, which was very successful, called The Limits of Love, which is all about Jews in England. And uh, I therefore got asked right away to start writing plays for television, as they were called in those days. Mm. And they they needed them so badly that, you know, as fast as I could turn them out, I was actually in the studio rehearsing them, which, mm. of course, is the best possible training you can imagine. I mean, all these film schools will never teach you what it's really like to be involved in production. Sure. Uh, they may teach you all kinds of stuff, but I doubt it. Anyway, um, and one of those plays that I wrote for television in 1960-61 was bought by a man called David Deutsch, a very nice film producer, who wanted to turn it into a movie. And my history of shame follows from that, really. <laughs> I, I, the, the film was quite successful. I then was introduced to... John Schlesinger and Joe Yanni, a wonderful couple of people who I spent a great deal of time with in my early 30s, slightly reluctantly, but partly with great pleasure because they were such fun to be with. Mm. And we made a movie called Darling, which then I won the Oscar. And, and, the, and rest... the BAFTA, let's not sell yourself short, and the BAFTA for Best Original Screenplay. That's how it all happened. Yeah. And um, how did you come up with the story of Darling? Like, was that something that you always kind of wanted to no. tell? Like, how, how did that all come about? No. Uh, Jerry Henny and John Schlesinger had just made two movies in, in the, the north of England, a grimy town called Bradford. Um, and they would, they wanted to do something which was like La Dolce Vita. Mm. So we sat down together, uh, all in, in, in Joe Yanni's office, and really put together this story. But we never thought whether people would like it. We thought whether we would like it. Sure. And that was, I didn't get any money, by the way, much. But anyway, that, that, was, that was quite fun. And we, we didn't have a title. And although I wouldn't want anyone else to say so, my biggest contribution to the success of the movie, not my only one, was I suddenly had the idea, let's call it Darling. Mm. And that kind of set up the whole spirit of the 1960s. And um, the rest of it is history, if history is what it is. Sure. And, and 
and when you're coming up with darling in you know because I, I, i'm i'm very fascinated with the process of creation right and that's what most of this podcast deals with whether it's talking to writers such as yourselves or 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 physicists or actors or musicians yes. we're you know like the the sort of connective tissue between all my guests is that everybody's kind of creating something whether it's finding a new truth in nature or finding a new truth in the human condition um that process of you sitting down with schlesinger and Giuliani, I'm sorry, that's what I'm hearing is Giuliani. What what what's the other person's name? Giuliani. Oh, He's Gio Italian. Okay, Giuliani. Joseph Yanni. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Joseph Yanni. Joseph yes. Yanni. Okay, now I got it. Are you guys sitting down with the old, you know, proverbial whiteboard on the wall and saying, this is a story we want to tell? Like, how are those early kind of outlining sessions going? And well, and, and like what can it teach you about collaboration? It's, it's, it's a good question. I, I had done a film before that, which was called Nothing But The Best, mm. uh, with Alan Bates and uh, Denham Elliott. And it was no great success in the box office, but it was a considerable hit among people who made films. Mm. So I had a certain contribution to make, and so, of course, did Yanni and Schlesinger. John Schlesinger came out of the documentary tradition of the... Uh, of the BBC. So he had a great belief that you went around asking people things until eventually you sort of got your story that way. I had absolutely no wish to do that, but I did it. Mm. And we we uh, first talked to a, a, a rank film starlet. Mm. The Joseph Rank, the Arthur Rank, J. Arthur Rank studio had a sort of a girls school attached to it. And uh, she was one of them. And she affected to tell us what it was like to be uh, involved with marriage as she was at that time with a very rich man who had, as it were, bought her youth. Uh, I thought it was pretty boring. And at a certain point I said, why don't I just go away and make something up? Um, by which I didn't mean I was going to fake it exactly, but I didn't find the presence of other people a great encouragement to invention. Mm. I would sooner be on my own, even to this day, uh, than discuss anything very much. Not, of course, with you, but um, in sure, terms of sure. writing something. I I've never, for instance, written a novel which I've talked to any publisher about before I started it. And when I did on a couple of times get commissioned, quite well commissioned to write a book, uh, I act a novel, I actually couldn't do that. Nonfiction is somewhat different. I've done a certain amount of historical writing and, and that, that I'm very happy to be commissioned for because you need the time to do the research. Mm. But, but what I like is, is looking at things that I have known and then seeing what I can make of them. Mm. Um, I, I, I've never, very fortunately, I, I've never suffered from writer's uh, block Mm. Mainly because if I wasn't writing a book, I was uh, I, I would write a short story, and if not a short story, a film. So I amuse myself with a variety of, of sort of personalities. Mm. And how how because I'm assuming in the early days, nowadays when you're writing a screenplay, the actual format of the screenplay is such a dominating aspect of the creation of one, yep. right? Like the idea that your actions need to be X length. Yes. And the, the idea but that you're not, you first know. Of all, as you can tell from my advanced age, I'm not <laughs> asked all that often now. So it's not a problem for me, but I, I treasure, um, there was a line by Jean-Luc Godard, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, in his say a very inventive and clever oh, user imagine. of the camera. Yeah, And somebody said to him, uh, do you believe that the, a film should have a beginning, a middle, and an end? And Godard said, yes, but not in that order necessarily. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and and, and I, don't, I don't think that following instructions or handbooks ever produces anything but second-class work. Mm. I may be wrong, and, and I don't care all that much, but I beginning, middle, and end is a bit facile. It puts you in the power of the commissioner. 
Mm. And I've always rather liked writing films, which is that great line of um, uh, of um, Stanislavski when uh, I think it was uh, Cocteau. Mm. He asked Cocteau to write a, a film, I think. And Cocteau said, what would you like it to be like? And he said, Stanislavski said, surprise me. Mm. And surprising people is part of the fun of showbiz. They think they're going to get one kind of thing, but with any luck, they get something, let's hope, better. I don't take instruction very willingly. Mm. And what, what's the mindset that you need to have to surprise? Because it's easier said than done, right? Like, there, Yes, there's... I, I, I can't really answer that. I mean... You, I'm afraid to say you have to be good at it. Right. It's right. like no, no, it's, it's a like, good answer. It's, it's, it's very like a game. You see, Tim, if I said to you, "How do I learn to be a good baseball player?" You say, "Well, the first thing would be be able to hit the ball quite hard with a baseball." <laughs> right, um, right. And in a sense, there's um, a certain writing, aptitude level that's required. Yeah. Right. Writing is a combination of hard work and, as I said before, luck and observation. It's also to do, in my view, with the willingness to work alone. Um, all kinds of people do all kinds of stuff. It's not a question of being better or more virtuous. But what, what I like about being a writer is they can't stop me doing it. Um, they cannot pay me. They cannot print the work. They can do all sorts of things. Mm. But the hand writes on, whether on the wall or on the page. <laughs> um, and, of course, they, they can kill you in certain circumstances. But sure. luckily, in the Anglo-American world I live in, they don't do a lot of that. Right. Um, I, I've been very fortunate, but I've also noticed, and I, I know my wife always says, don't talk about Jews. Mm. Um, on the other hand, they do walk down the middle of history's page, particularly in the present say, last century. And I've been very lucky personally, but at the same time, I have watched the pain of others. Mm. And so or without trying to take advantage of it, um, I've been very aware of it. And I usually try to avoid claiming experiences I don't have by wishing them on fictional characters. That's what I do. And have you have you spent um, any time in Israel yourself? <laughs> I, I I I did a, a travel television series in British television about uh, oh God help me thirty years ago, and I spent a couple of weeks in Israel. But I I don't go to synagogue. I don't believe the Jews. I believe the Jews have a, have a right to live. But I don't believe that they have any particularly destined role in the world. Sure. So I didn't I didn't really want to be there very much. And huh. I was treated while I was there by an Arab doctor who said to me, what do you think of it all? And I couldn't pretend that I thought it was all ideal. On the other hand, of course, you know, where is ideal? They used to think the Soviet Union was ideal. I've right. been reading a book about, about, about Russia during the the height of the Stalinist era. I mean, you mm. can't imagine a more miserable place. Sure. He took all the joy out of everything in order to dominate it. As for Israel, um, I don't think Netanyahu is exactly somebody whose lead I would wish to follow, but it's their business, not mine. I'm, I'm now, fortunately, too mm. old to um, pontificate. Though <laughs> right. I personally, um, I'm not super... Um, educated, I, I, you know, I must admit on the politics and the this and the that, but I have thoroughly enjoyed my time in Israel. Um, I'm fascinated with the city of Jerusalem or Jerusalem, as they call it over there. Yes. And it, and just to see the layer of history as you're walking down a street, oh, literally yes. by looking down into a hole and seeing the Byzantine Empire and seeing the Roman yeah, Empire. Right. I mean, when one goes into the into the temple where Jesus is supposedly buried, it is, sure. it is a strange experience. Not that I believe, if that makes any, it's not of the smallest importance. But I mean, the idea that he's the Son of God is very strange. Um, 
and it leads into all sorts of contradictions within the Trinity and so on. So the fact that the Jews and the Muslims actually had a much clearer, simple idea of God mm. uh, was a good reason for the British and others to put them at loggerheads with each other. And I notice, uh, you know, with a certain irony, the, the, the Western press never worries very much about Syrians killing each other. Mm. But if a Israeli, you know, sips on the toe of an Arab in the old school, they, they put that on the news. I don't think Israelis necessarily behave any better than anybody else. They probably behave much like everybody else, except that they have a certain pride in who they are, mm. which a number of people in the Western world have lost. Mm. Uh, I don't mean it makes them bad people, but they do. S the British, I rather like the British when they were grand. Then you could be grand and well, they controlled to Israel themselves, right? They controlled Israel and most of the planet at that point. Yes, I mean, the, you know, I, I, I wouldn't wish Israel to be, God knows, I wouldn't wish it to be in any way not there. Um, of course. that it is there in a place which is not very convenient, right? Um, it's part of the, for want of a better word, comedy mm. of history, which is, of course, indistinguishable from tragedy very often. Mm. Now, well, your, reaction, your reaction is the right one, but then you're younger than I am. Right, um, you know, and for me, I'm, I'm just, I'm so fascinated with, um, with human history, you know, and like everything well, that oh, history yeah. has to teach because it's an endless, it's an endless resource of learning, you know, and, and with it, and in Israel, when you see just the, how incredibly slick and smooth the pay, the 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 rocks are on the streets you yes. can you can see the effect of thousands of years of human pedestrians walking up and down those streets have created yes, and, and also of course a, a long long history of literacy mm. the, 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 i mean the people of the book is not an idle phrase though of course it applies to muslims as well and uh, but but the, the i'm book, not familiar with that phrase the people of the book i really like the that people, I, yes the people of the book and is you know on the whole jews have a higher rate of literacy than uh, any comparable group um it doesn't make them better it doesn't make them wiser but it makes them in some ways more aware mm. because the past and the future and the present work together with was, is, and will. Um, and I think that one of the fears about modern society, which, you know, is the least of my worries, you might say, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> right. the illiteracy of, of the subtitles on the television, for instance, endless grammatical and other mistakes, are teaching the young not much, mm. um, and a good deal of it mistaken. Um, and I think the cowardice of the of the teaching class, whether in uh, in in schools or universities, is is very sad. My friend Joe Epstein, uh, whom you may or may not know, do you know Joe Epstein's work at all? I do not. Yeah, he he taught he taught at Northwestern for a long time uh, English, and he never signed up to being a full time professor. He was one, but his great strength is to fight against the, the stream and to believe that actually you can teach people things and sometimes you know more than your pupils. The mm. humbug of claiming to learn more from your pupils than they do from you, well, save it. Mm. Yeah, I think that there's, um, especially in Western countries, and look, and this is only me from afar, I haven't been in university since 1998 when I graduated from New York University in film, um, but I I haven't been around the school system that much, but the perception that I have is that there's been this um, sort of de-emphasizing of sort of critical thinking in terms of actually um, questioning beliefs, right? And like having a thesis and, and being unafraid to being proven wrong, right? Where it's like, Yes, I mean, it's, it's not only that. Let me put it very bluntly. Mm -hmm. um, by sheer chance, I was taken from 
the United States when I was eight years old. And yeah, 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 which is England fascinating. In, you uh, lived in Chicago, right? Like you were born yeah. in Chicago. Well, we yeah. lived in New York, actually. My oh, first okay. school, my first school was ethical culture in New York. Oh, okay. And, you know, the middle class Jewish school. Anyway, I, I, I arrived in it. My father was British, and we arrived in England in 1938, and we were supposed to go back to New York in 39, but we didn't. So I was given an education which I would never have had in America, uh, which I don't say is better or blah, blah, blah. It's not worth talking about. But it included, as an absolute base, Latin and Greek grammar. Mm. Can you imagine anything less appealing to mm. young people now? But the great advantage about uh, grammar and literature is that in many ways they are not matters of opinion. Mm. Uh, as in mathematics, you learn the grammar because that's what the grammar is. Mm. Uh, you can make a mistake if you want to, but it will be a mistake, not mm. an invention. Some people can trump that, but not much. Um, today's education, apart from in the sciences, is a question of trying to say things which will please people. Mm. Um, and the whole nonsense about whether, the, you know, whether we now have many sexes. Um, and I noticed that J.K. Rowling, who has entertained literally millions and millions of people with her mm. stories, which I have never read and never wished to read, uh, has now become <laughs> a, a figure of abhorrence. Right. She doesn't agree that you can choose which sex you are. Sure. Well, as the French say quite often, je rêve ou quoi? Am I dreaming or what? <laughs> because the idea of asking a four-year-old child whether he's a boy or a girl, it's just mad, that's mm. all. And, and But so enraged are people with bizarre opinions these days. Right. That if you say the wrong thing, they will ruin you if they can. And of course, J.K. Rowling is an example of somebody who is so successful that the only thing they can do is to knock her off her pedestal. I hope she doesn't care. Um, but it's very, the vanities of the present are quite remarkable because they're based on opinions which they think will recruit admirers. Right, uh, right. Largely. That's very an interesting uh, and, 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 and the, the, the It's very strange because I was, I was noticing the other day that T.S. Eliot, who is not necessarily a person I admire with undiluted uh, affection, but he, he in his day in the 1940s and 50s thought that writers should actually alienate their readers. Mm. The great thing was to stand alone and with clarity. I'm not sure he always did that. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure he didn't, but perhaps that's why he admired it. T.S., yeah. Yeah, there, 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 seems, there seems to be this... Uh, I mean, you're saying it perfectly, this idea of having slightly unfounded opinions to gain admiration and then somehow this sort of mythology becomes this un unquestioned truth yes and any any uh, you know any discussion about that even the discussion itself is seen as an egregious act against this sort yes. of accepted truth yes. and that's just not a healthy way to dialogue no uh, th there was a, a, a very well-known American journalist in the 1930s called Walter Lippmann. I don't know whether you still know about him. No. But um, he, he, he wrote a book which I read, God help me, probably 70 years ago, <laughs> uh, which is really, which, which is about the common ground which we ought to live on mm. and talk on. Now, the fact that you don't agree with me about this or that, whether it's how good X is or how bad Y, that's fine. Wittgenstein, whom I venerated when I was at Cambridge, uh, uh, claimed that the great way to talk to other people with whom you disagree is not to disagree with them, but to ask them to tell you more. Mm. Uh, and then as they talked and told more, it just might be they will begin to see that they weren't necessarily right. Right. It goes all right. the way back. To, it goes all the way back to Socrates, who I think pretended to to be curious, while at the same time being quite opinionated. Uh, Wittgenstein, as opposed to Heidegger, a very bad man. 
mm -hmm. um, didn't advance opinions. He invited you to give yours and then question them. This seems to me to be an honest and proper way to proceed. And if you're not willing to defend your position without shouting at me or using one of the guns, which I see behind you in that rack, right. Um, right. then you don't know what it is to be civilized. Alas, as we see with Russia, um, not being civilized is quite a common condition these days. Mm. Perhaps always was, but the education which middle America gets, if I may dare to say so, is 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 not the one which conduces to listening to other people's point of view and accepting the idea that in a democracy we're not all going to agree. Big deal. Right. And that's almost the beauty of it, because to your point, to say more uh, and and if the common ground is that we're both going to agree that we're going to talk about our belief and say as much as we can about it and share as much as we can about it to each other. To your point, just that act of listening, like you said earlier in our conversation, creates that common ground, right? And like now it's, it's like... Yes, yes. I know. mean, it's it's very possible. In fact, it's almost certain that uh, almost anybody will know more about certain topics than others. And it's very foolish to suppose that being what used to be called educated, made you right all the time. It doesn't make you right, but it does make you alert to yeah. falsehoods, contradictions, and so on. And people who can't endure a civil question about what they've just said um, are not civilized. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's as simple as that. You don't have to be. Right. But we have always thought it was a good idea. The, one of the sort of weird things that I've been seeing online more and more, it's that if you question the CDC, if you question the FBI, if you question the CIA, and these are like authoritative, um, you know, um, monoliths in this country. And if you question any of these things, you are extreme right wing, which to me is like taking my brain and like in a blender and exploding it because just 10 years ago, it was the exact opposite perception, you know, that, yes. you know, that these monoliths were seen as more slightly right wing things. Now, yes. if you don't believe every single word they say, you're extreme right wing. And but this is I, like, I, I, again, rather jumping from what you're saying, but it yeah. occurs to me that television, you know, is neither good nor bad. It's there. But it does lead to the silencing of the audience in favor of sitting and listening, usually to people who repeat themselves mm. in various ways, whether on the left or the right. And you have no means of you have no means of frustrating them, even if you are frustrated. Mm. And you just have to take it. And the amount of socializing may, of course, exist to a great extent. But again, Pop music has led to a great deal of everybody waving in their hands together and clapping. But it has not led, in the modern world, to civil conversation between people of the same age, out of perhaps boredom. I mean, when I was at Cambridge in the 1950s, God help me, you know, we didn't have television. Uh, it existed, but we didn't have it. Right. There was the radio. But on the whole, if you wanted conversation, company, uh, enthusiasm, interest, you talk face to face with other people. Mm. The television audience does not talk face to face. It is recruited by various people who are either plausible, amusing, or downright wicked. Mm. Um, and so there's never a chance of saying, Excuse me, are you not full of shit by any chance? <laughs> All right, so 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 to go back a little bit towards your fascinating career in in the film industry, after collaborating back to back with John Schlesinger on uh, Darling and um, and uh, Far From the Matting Crowd, is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, you got to work with another very very reputable director, uh, Peter Bogdanovich. How, yes. how did that, how did that collaboration with you and Mr. Bogdanovich come to be? Well, I was. <clears throat> Funnily enough, I was writing a television series for English television, which was called The Glittering Prizes, or I'd just been commissioned to do that. Mm. And I did that because I didn't. I thought that in television in England in those days, not now, um, it was possible to be 
for want of a better word, the author. Mm -hmm. And so I was. Um, and, and the man who uh, commissioned that, uh, whose name was, oh my God, and here I go again. Anyway, he was a friend of Bogdanovich. <laughs> and at that time, there was a strike. I have to tell you the truth, even though it's not particularly reputable. There was a strike in the American uh, Screenwriters Guild, as there is now, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that did not apply to European productions. Mm. So Peter Bogdanovich had been told by Orson Welles mm. Uh, that um, uh, oh god, what was the fame? What was the film called? Remind me again. You know uh, the 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 one that you did, uh, Daisy yes. Miller. Daisy Miller, the one that you yes, did. Yes, with, yes, yes. Um, he had he had Orson Welles had told Peter Bogdanovich that his then girlfriend um, was made to mm. play Daisy Miller. Um, what was her name? Um, was, that 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 goes even beyond my. Uh, oh yes, you will know because she was on television uh, in that series. Oh yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Um, it was. Um, yes. Uh, Sybil Shepherd. It was Sybil Shepherd. Yeah. Yes. So, wait, Orson Welles was dating Sybil Shepherd. That's news to me. I no, 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 no. He 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 thought that he was a friend of of of, um, of Bogdanovich, and he Bogdanovich was with uh, Sybil Shepherd. Right, right. And right. and 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 Orson said. Uh, you know, you should uh, you should make uh, Daisy Miller because she's made for it. You know, mm. she was blonde and supposedly innocent. She wasn't all that innocent, I don't think, but never mind that. <laughs> anyway, um, I got a message from Peter Bogdanovich, who was very successful at that time. Sure. He'd just done uh, What's Up, Dog. Right. Saying, would I, would I consider writing a screenplay of what Daisy Miller? And I read the book, which is very... It's a short, shortish novel, and not not immensely captivating. But there it was. So I tried to think of how we could do that in a way which would be original and scintillating and worthy of Mr. Bogdanovich. And I had the idea that I should do Daisy Miller, which was set in the eighteen seventies, that it should be the story of the eternal American girl coming to Europe. So my idea was to tell the story forwards of Daisy Miller, but to change the date so that without any of the actors noticing, the whole thing moved from the 1870s to the 1970s. Mm. And I thought that was pretty smart. Mm. Um, and maybe it was, but when Bogdanovich heard, of course, he thought of the budget. Right. And if you're going to do a movie with new costumes and new settings every 10 years it gets a lot expensive so he said i just want to make daisy miller <laughs> no that's what you want that's what you get and that's what i did i wasn't particularly proud of it i was absolutely amazed yeah yeah. you almost forgot the name of it i mean you know <laughs> yes, I mean, but, but anyway uh bogdanovich was an interesting character did you ever know him i not personally no no, no. he's uh he, yeah he was a very good mimic he wasn't funny himself, but he could be funny through mimicry. He was also, he wasn't immensely likable, mm. even though we got on very well. And Sybil Shepherd was practicing tap dancing in the bathroom of the hotel in, Connaught Hotel, very fancy hotel in, uh, in London, while uh, Peter and I were talking. And I remember that, that um, Sybil came out of, the, out of the bathroom where she'd been doing this tap dancing, and Bogdanovich looked at her and said, what, 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 what are you doing to your face? And she said, what, what do you mean? He said, y y your face is kind of looks a bit strange. He had a way of making people <laughs> uncertain of themselves, which right. may work to dominate. It doesn't always work to bring out the best work. Yeah. Um, and anyway, I, I don't think, I, I noticed that um, that very, oh yes, it was, um, the director of a uh, very, very famous director has just written an article about Daisy Miller saying how good it was. So, you know, if you wait around long enough, maybe uh, you'll pick up the praise you didn't get first time around. <laughs> sure. Um, Bogdanovich then asked me to do another movie with him, which is called Long Last Love. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, that one I haven't heard of, no. Well, it, he made a film called Long Last Love, which right. was which was called, which was a, a musical, which mm. was quite also with Sybil, which was quite disastrous. 
And somebody said to, uh, do you know the story? Somebody said to Billy Wilder, mm. um, what about uh, The Godfather 2? Don't you think it's pretty damn courageous to make a film called Godfather 2? And Billy said, no, what's courageous is at long last love too. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and and for the audience that doesn't know, uh, Peter Bogdanovich directed a film, I think right before What's Up, Doc, called The Last Picture Show, also with uh, with Sybil yes. Shepherd. That was before and I, What's Up. And that made his name. Right. Because people, some 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 academic circles praise that film as the second most important film ever made after Citizen Kane. Like, like people praise it at that level. So now that you mentioned that Orson Welles was somehow in the mix, introducing um, you and, and Peter Bogdanovich, it kind of makes sense that maybe Orson Welles himself kind of put that tag on it because- I, I, I have no idea. Right. Uh, my favorite story about Orson, which you may know, <clears throat> is that he was invited to lunch by somebody that I happen to know mm. um, at La Maison in, uh, in L.A. And uh, Orson arrived early and uh, then had a message from his host saying he was very sorry, he was on his way, but he had been delayed. So eventually he arrived and Orson was sitting at the table and uh, it had been laid for two. And when they, they then ordered the meal and they talked or whatever it was, and at the end, uh, the other guy asked for the bill. Mm. And the bill came. Do you know this story? I do not. I, I'm fascinated already. <laughs> I do not. When know the bill story. came, it was for three lunches. Mm. So uh, whoever this guy was said to the, uh, the maitre d', uh, you, you, you've put three lunches. Why? We well, said, Mr. Wells had lunch before you came. <laughs> so oh, he actually eaten his way through two complete lunches, <laughs> right. which accounts to beat. some extent for his later day shape. So, so, so I'm kind of bearing the lead here, and this has been so fascinating that I'm starting to run out of time. But I'd be remiss if I don't ask you about, you know, one of the most, for me, the most fascinating tale because number one, I absolutely love this movie, even though a lot of people have been critical of this film and you know to me stanley kubrick is the greatest filmmaker that's you know that's ever lived in my opinion right it's a very subjective notion you know i think 2001 is as is as good a movie as it gets um but i saw eyes wide shut in the cinema about five times in the cinema i've seen it many uh -huh. times since then i've read Le Trom novel which is a fascinating little novella and I think the screenplay of that movie is absolutely incredible. And I know that you've probably talked about this ad nauseum, given the status of who Stanley Kubrick is in terms of mythology, right? Of like great sort of artists. Um, how did the, these sort of roads converge between you um, and Mr. Kubrick? I mean, because that sounds like a fascinating no, no, no. moment. Stanley, as you probably know, was a secrecy obsessed. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think what it came from. I do not know. Nothing to do with the movies much, although it was revealed in the movies. So I can I at one stage I started getting messages about somebody wanted to know whether I was available and all that stuff, which of course entirely depended on what it was for. But when I heard that it was Kubrick, I confess that um, you know I was flattered. Hmm. Um, I had first seen his movies in 1978 when I happened to go into a movie house and saw um, the one about the Great War. Barry um, Lyndon. Yes, and, and also the, the first one, The Killing. And hmm. I thought he was absolutely wonderful. I'd never heard of him before. So I was very flattered. And he then sent me the book, or he sent me the book of Schnitzler's story with the name of the author cut out. So I couldn't, you know, a reproduction. And asked me whether I thought it could be a movie. And I said, well, what do you, what do you want it, how do you want it to be? I, I never imagined, as I had with the early movies that I did when I was considerably younger, that I was going to make it, as they say, mine. It was going to be Stanley's movie. And I didn't have any reluctance because, because he, exactly as you were saying, you know, he is, to say the least, one of the most remarkable directors ever. Mm. And people have thought that we didn't get on very well because I was this 
suck up supposedly Englishmen. But in fact, of course, partly because of the Jewish connection. Uh, you remember, I did, I, did you read my little book called Eyes Wide Open? I have not read Eyes Wide Open. Well, I think you damn well should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. It, will tell you, it will tell you quite a lot. Stanley and I actually got on extremely well because we were so different. And I had directed a little movie for uh, for David Brown for RKO, uh, not RKO for HBO. Mm. And Stanley saw my little movie on the on the on the box. He said to me, "Did you did you direct that as well as write it?" So I said, "Well, yes, I did. I I had David Lean's cameraman, but never mind." Well, he <laughs> said, "You know, you're a pretty good director." So oh, I that said, must have felt great. Stanley. Like. You know, that, that felt even great for me. And I don't even, you know, I just met you, but that feels like a great compliment. It was a half hour movie. <laughs> so he said, no, you're a pretty good director. He said, that's why you're never going to come on my set. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley, Stanley had a way of having a little kick in the back, but we got on very well and he wanted to make another movie with me and whatever his family may like to say. You know, I know that's true. I, I really love being with him. We talked for hours and hours because he was very lonely. Mm. Um, or at least he seemed very lonely. Uh, the family are very keen to say how happy he was at home. Uh, you know, everyone's happy at home, supposedly. But he was, he put himself into a castle and then he regretted that nobody came to see him, mm. so to speak. So we got on very well because we talked on the, uh, you know, on, on this machine. A great deal or on the telephone um, and because we weren't in each other's space it made it rather easier I think to talk and I wrote him he said I don't know what I want but when you write it I'll know that's what I want so will you either do it or do it again or do it again and again and so on and that's how we proceeded he, he never made suggestions he only said yes or no Interesting. So just so I get this right, you have La Trombe Novelle, which is a fascinating little novella. Um, you start writing drafts of Eyes Wide Shut. You send him, first of all, before I even go there, because um, man, I got to get these questions in as fast as possible. Um, where did the name Eyes Wide Shut come from? Well, it came from Stanley, Stanley Kubrick because I thought it was an absolutely asinine title. <laughs> and, uh, my much more modest down the line version was I wanted to call it Woman Unknown, which was the woman who was killed in the uh, thing. Anyway, he suggested Eyes Wide Shut. I said, I think it's a dreadful title. And as you know, <laughs> it's actually he was right and I was wrong. Can happen. <laughs> so you wanted to call it Woman Unknown because of the woman who dies in yes, the exactly. in the party. Also because women are unknown, aren't they? I sure, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. We, we don't quite know where we are with them. One minute they want to rule the world because they know exactly what's right. The next minute, you know, they spend thousands and thousands of dollars on makeup trying to change who they are and look different and all the rest of it. Don't we all? I mean, what what is greatly missing? Stanley was not a great comedian, to put it mildly. He didn't like jokes. When I put jokes in, he said, oh, that sounds like Stanley Donnan. Um whom he quite admired, incidentally, but never mind. Um, I, I, I think Stanley missed something in life by by a certain grimness, which I'm sure went back to his childhood. He didn't get in. He didn't get into Columbia, which I think he would have liked to do. So he spent his life with his nose pressed against the glass of of smart people that he thought perhaps were smarter than they really were. Who knows? Can happen. Mm. And and um, so Stanley would just take your drafts and just literally just give you binary feedback, yes, no. Well, what, what, hap what happened? What happened was that he he eventually I said, listen, Stanley, we can talk about what it might be, but we need to have something on a piece on a piece of paper to like or dislike. So he said, okay. So I said, I'm going to start, and he said, well, will you will you send me fifty pages? So I said, well, I hate doing that. But I will because it's you, and I did. <laughs> um, and he, I still remember he rang up on Christmas Eve and said, "Freddie, can you talk?" He always said, "Can you talk?" As if I was a spy, you know. <laughs> I said yes. He said, "Well, I." I, I love this. Oh, he, said, he said, uh, "Well, I, I, I read the pages, Emily." So I said yes. He said, "I'm absolutely thrilled." 
Oh, that's well, awesome. When Stanley Kubrick says, I'm absolutely thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take it, that's a fairly high point in a screenwriter's life. It didn't stay like that all the time because he then became worried about this or worried about that. But it was it was a hell worth living in. Oh, man, that sounds fast. So, so first of all, you just said something that just blew my mind because one of the obsessions that I have with Eyes Wide Shut is that from a purely visual aesthetic perspective, it's a Christmas movie. The entire movie takes place during Christmas. And in almost every single shot, there is a visual motif of Christmas. Was that something that you wrote into no, it? Or was this post not. this conversation? I, I, don't, I, don't Christmas know, Eve? I don't know why he did that, unless it was a certain kind of irony. He was pretty good at irony, not very good at comedy. Um, but but I, I was certainly nothing to do with me at all. Um, because you're not even discussing setting like uh, in terms of time. Like it's not in your script. It didn't say it's Christmas time in New York City. Like that never even touched the page. Yes, I I, I think it was probably because it, it 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 gave an edge of irony to the whole piece. Sure. Um, because of the you know the the the. the you know, it wasn't malice that the film had in it. It it had suspicion, a great deal right. of suspicion of That's the man of life it. Uh, and so on. The, the thing which I said to the, the original title of Schnitzler's story was Traum Novella, which means the dream novel yeah. or novella. And I said to Stanley at one point, you know, you, you, you can do what you like, but this whole thing is a dream mm. and if you remember he had a, the apartment which the doctor lived in was like a two million dollar apartment of the 1960s and uh Woody Allen made great comedy of the fact that you know mm. it was so sumptuous but of course if it's a dream apartment that rather alters the structure mm. I dream about New York a great deal I did so last night I was in a very fancy place mm. um I think that Stanley took to heart what I said to him about the dream. Um, it was never real. He wasn't really, you know, it was the doctor's dream of what life was like. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, the, the Jewish, not calling him by a Jewish name did not mean that Stanley was ashamed of being Jewish. He wanted a bigger audience. That was mm -hmm. his main concern once he decided to make the movie. And, <coughs> um, I remember him saying to me on one occasion, when I, I wrote about the two doctors walking away from the hospital, talking together, and he said to me, uh, well, well, what are they talking about? So I said, oh, Stanley, I don't know what, what the doctors talk about. And, uh, you know, that whatever. He said, well, you know, those people, you know, meaning Gentiles. You never know what they're talking about. <laughs> You think to yourself, are you nuts or what? <laughs> right. Yeah, because like you know, for me, and like I have to share this with you because it's always been my kind of insight about the movie, and I don't think I've ever read this. I've just this is what I take from the movie, and it might be you know so obvious to you, but I have to share it, which is this incredible piece about a man whose infidelities are completely real and tangible in the context of the story but feel like a complete and total dream. And then the infidelities of the wife that are a complete dream, and she admits that they're a dream, but to the doctor, they feel completely real. So it's like this, this kind of perception of reality and dreams is completely kind of intertwined with each other in this weird reverse polarity in that story. And at the end, Maybe I think one of the greatest lines that ever ends a movie of all time, which is like, and I'm going to probably butcher it, but let's go home and fuck, you know, like, let's get past all of your weird paranoia. Let me get past all of my weird fantasies and just be carnal together. Right. Like that, that's the exclamation yes. point at the end well, of the, the film. The truth of the matter is, however, that, uh, however good you are at the carnal aspect, it don't go on forever, mm. and it doesn't cover everything which we like to think mm. goes into human life. In particular, people don't usually do a lot of talking while they're 
having sex, though I, I'm sure some people do it all the time. <laughs> right. um, it, it, it was a good way to end the movie. It does not solve the problem of life mm. because, of course, there isn't one, a solution, I mean. And, and did you ever, um, you mentioned that Stanley didn't want you on set. Did you ever actually go to the set? Did I ever actually go? I think I did, actually. Yes, I, I, I did a, a couple of times. But as you probably know, I'm sure you do know, um, for anyone who isn't directing the movie or acting in it, it's quite boring. Oh, very much so. You know, one, one thing. You know, one thing that I just thought about that is such an incredibly fun little irony here. Speaking of irony, is that Peter Bogdanovich actually was cast, I believe, in the role that Sidney Pollack ended up playing in the movie, and then they had to reshoot it or you know what maybe it wasn't peter bogdanovich maybe it was no 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 no, you're quite wrong peter bogdanovich um was not ever mentioned um it was um it was harvey keitel right exactly it it was harvey Harvey keitel it was harvey and i I like apparently harvey did something on the set which i won't begin to guess what it was something which (laughs) offended somebody anyway then they they fired him actually harvey would have been very good Right, right, because they had to reshoot all of his scenes. Well, he has an edge of of smart vulgarity about him. Not personally. I like him, actually. Do you know Harvey? I've never met him personally. He's a very, very nice fellow. But um, I'm not sure that Sidney Pollock, he didn't do anything wrong. I'm not sure that he did Stanley any favors. Mm. in his editing of that last scene. I think Stanley would have been cleverer than that. Mm. Um, I don't but mean do you he think Sidney Pollack was, anyway, was involved with uh, uh, the editing? Harvey Keitel, while he was, while he was, um, when he was, went to the studio, Harvey, he was staying at this fancy hotel in, in London, uh, carriages. And uh, he came home in a limo, uh, or limo, I think they now say, um, and it was pissing with rain, and uh, he had not perhaps behaved all that well as a guest of this hotel. And it, the doorman came out into the middle of the road with a big, a big umbrella and opened the door. And when he saw that it was Harvey who was getting out of the car, he folded up the umbrella and went back into the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, the the girl was played at one point by Jennifer Jason Lee, I believe, and she also got dismissed from the film and was replaced. Because one of the sort of legends about Eyes Wide Shut, and maybe you can finally validate this or bu- debunk it for me, is that Stanley Kubrick was obsessed with making artificial intelligence, AI. And yes. the studio was like, you've been working on this thing forever. You know, we have um, uh, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman under contract. Um, you want to make this little Trom Novell thing. Let's do a nine month shoot. You make Trom Novell. We get it in and out quickly. And then you can have as much time as you want on AI. Right. And that a nine month shoot ended up being a three year shoot. Yes. Is that is that at all? Is there some truth to that? I, I don't know the truth of that. It sounds typical of Stanley. <laughs> right. because, I mean, he he had an absolute dictatorial detestation of being dictated to. Mm. Um, I I had I, I enjoyed our conversations because we were the Jewish thing was a link. Mm. Um, you know, I I happened to be an American citizen in spite of my. Adopted accident. Right. So that's also a link, right? He was also American. Yeah. I migrated mean, I, I was, to England. I was born in Chicago. I mean, it, it, I've always enjoyed American movies. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I like working with Stanley Donnan for the same reason. Uh, English movies are rarely as good as they people think they are um, because the English are not good at visualizing. They, they, mm. They do chat very well and all the rest. Anyway, it's not it's not it's not a competition. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I don't. I, I, he never mentioned AI. When I, I mean, I I came on to write um, Eyes Wide Shut, as it's now called. Um, there have been several writers hired before that, but he never showed me a version of anything they had done. And well, he there were several did... writers for Trom Novell before you and Stanley um, started to collaborate. Yes, but, yes. but 
I never knew they had, and my vanity didn't let me think that they had, but they had. But he never showed me anything that anyone else had written, and he kept a very straight face. We started afresh. Um, I was rather old. 30 years ago, I was quite old. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't immensely proud. I was very pleased to work with Stanley, mm. but it wasn't, you know, I, I had been around the block a few times. So it, it, it was just fine. And I never knew when he was going to make it. I mean, I can still remember saying to him, he said to me, you know, what are you going to do this summer? I said, I don't know, you know, go, going to my house in France. He said, well, what, I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, uh, I guess I better try and make this movie. That was the first I knew that he actually intended to shoot. He then had to get permission, of course, from the studio to spend a lot of money. So I said, what are you going to do? Are you going to send them the script? He said, oh, no. He said, what I do is I, I send the message to the head of the studio. I can't remember who those people were. Uh, so they should come to London. So they, they, I put them up in the hotel in London with their money, of course. And uh, <laughs> I can almost hear Peter Sellers' impersonation of Stanley <laughs> as you speak. And, uh, you know, uh, I give them the script to read. Well, I mean, what can they do? They come all this way, spend all this money. So, you know, they're going to have to give me the money to make the script, which is what he did. Right. It didn't. You know, I I don't know whether it made money in the end. Perhaps you know. It didn't. It didn't. Um, it was considered. You know, it had a very big opening, but it yes. it fell. It fell very quickly. And, yes, it did. You know, Stanley Kubrick films are are very demanding intellectually. You know, yeah. and like um, at the time, people had expectations of who Tom Cruise was, of who Nicole Kidman yeah. was, and Tom Cruise doesn't run around and kill anybody in this movie. That's right. Uh, you know, so it was a little bit of a different role. Even though I yeah. actually think Tom Cruise is phenomenal as the doctor in Eyes well, Wide Shut. Yeah, I mean, Stanley beat him up a great deal, and he took it very bravely. Hmm. You know, he wanted to please, as we all did with Stanley. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was not an easy man to work with. There's a good story about one of his first assistants that he relied on greatly, and at one point while shooting... Uh, yeah, yeah. I've met him and I've interviewed him thoroughly for a documentary I did about uh, Full Metal Jacket. Oh, right. What's his uh, name? Oh, God. I, I, I feel so bad because he passed away recently. Um, oh, God. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. I, I, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm having a little it bit of amnesia. Does. Yeah, yeah. But 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 I'm sorry. Continue with your story about, the, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in that. About what? You, you, you were saying that there was a story about his assistant. Oh, yes. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite funny because uh, at some point, he, the assistant whom he'd worked with for many years came up. Leon Vitali was his name. Can I keep going? Yeah, yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Leon Vitali, <laughs> just to interject. Came up to him and, and wanted to ask him something. And, and Stanley was busy with something. And he said, oh, fuck off. So he went away. And then a few minutes later, Stanley said, where's, uh, I can't remember what his name was. So they said, well, he, he, he's he gone home. So he said, what? He said, he's, he's gone home? Why has he gone home? So he said, you told him to fuck off. <laughs> well, he said, that's no reason to go. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. What what Do you remember what the last exchange was between you and Stanley? The last what? Exchange. The last one yes, I, I remember very well because he asked me to go out to see the script that he was proposing to shoot. Four Eyes Wide Shut. Yes. Yep. And I he I went out as usual in a taxi that he sent so I wouldn't find my own way to where he lived. <laughs> right. And I sat with the, with the script that he proposed to shoot in front of me. And I suddenly realized that I actually had him in my power because he was submitting the script to me rather than as I had done for the last three years, the other way around. So I put a lot of marks on the script rather naughtily and question marks <laughs> and all the rest. <laughs> and um, eventually he, uh, he came back and uh, looked at it and he, he was quite humble 
I mean, not humble, but he was quite accessible to my ideas and all the rest of it. We did all that. Anyway, in the end, he said, well, uh, that's, you know, thank you for what you've done. And we went out into the forecourt of his sort of private Auschwitz. And, um, and he put his arm around me and he said, it's not that bad a life being a screenwriter, is it? <laughs> so he gave me a very clear indication that he would like to work with me again. And unfortunately, as you know, he mm. did. Last question about Stanley. Um, Stanley Kubrick, very famous throughout my sort of life while he was still alive and still out there making movies, Full Metal Jacket, etc. cetera. Um, there was always this story that he refused to allow Clockwork Orange to play in England because the English uh, a censor board wanted to censor certain parts of Eyes Wide uh, of um, of Clockwork Orange. Now, fast forward to Eyes Wide Shut. Eyes Wide Shut after his passing was cut up tremendously, right? With yeah. like digital super, yeah. you know, imposed images yeah. and all kinds of edits. Do you think? Stanley would have allowed those things to happen to his film if he was still alive when it got released. I I I, I don't say this with any. <laughs> I, I I can't say it with a story. Mm. Um, uh, Tony Fruin, who is his assistant and is the only person in his uh, entourage that I ever met, um, said to me once um, that there were two things which uh, he'd seen Stanley really happy. One was when he read the first draft of my pages of Eyes Wide Shut. Wow. And the other was when he got a check for five million bucks for, for um, 2001. Oh. I don't wish to, we all love money, although we may or may not admit it. Um, whether Stanley would have resisted, I don't know. I think he might well have resisted having the film cut up. But as you know, it's happened to quite a lot of movies. Sure. I, I was watching um, The Producers the other night, mm. and uh, I used to laugh alone watching The Producers. Not many people do that. <laughs> and when I saw it, they'd missed out. They'd cut that section, which you may remember, where the dancing Hitlers was supposed to be one side of the stage and the singing Hitlers were on the other side. You remember this? Yeah, yeah, they cut they, that out? They cut that out. I don't know what authority they had to cut it, but the truth is, as you and I, and a lot of people know, including the Writers Guild, that the executives are in the process of ruining the whole creative input of individuals into their schemes mm. and making lots of chewing gum for television. Uh, that's what's happening. I haven't seen Oppenheimer yet. I wish I had. I know quite a lot about him, and I'm very interested to see what they've left in and left out. Mm. But... The truth is the studios have acquired all the power. In the old days, when you went out to the studio, your agents, I remember my agents saying to me, uh, take, take take the tie off, Freddie, huh? Mm. You don't want to wear a tie. It looks like you're, you know, one of them. Interesting. Uh, and the, the directors for a long time were very powerful. And one or two of them, no doubt, still are. But they are powerful like men wearing golden chains, most of them. Mm. Such is the price of uh, of fame. Um, yes, yes. I mean, you know, everybody as they get older thinks, you know, thank God I won't be here because it's all going down the drain. Maybe it is. Maybe the drain's where we've always lived. I don't know. That's that's beautiful stuff. Look, you've given me more time than I expected. I'm I'm so grateful to hear your words. I could chat with you all day. This is some fascinating stuff. I love how you manage to find humor in all of these very serious topics. Oh, I appreciate that. I, I definitely, definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I'd i love to keep in touch with you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll send you my email. Well, you've, and got, stuff. you've got my, my, my address, haven't you? Yes. Please yes. Do. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're Frederick, very, you're very good at not saying too much. <laughs> well, I'll take that as a compliment. I'll take that as a compliment. Oh yes. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. The yeah. number of interviews you watch on television where the interviewer does all the talking. Right, right. Anyway, where, there it all is. Where, where to your point, I want to do the listening because, you know, like it's a very rare occasion that I get to chat with somebody that has your life experience and that can articulate it so well because there's there's so much to learn from listening, you know? So I, I love that you started this conversation with 
listening being the number one uh, sort of virtue that a writer could have. Um, and I tried to listen as much as possible and I feel like I could listen forever. So thank you very much, Frederick. Um, is there anything that you have planned um, for the future in terms of new projects? Or are you just kind of sort of relaxing no, and enjoying you know, life? At the age of 92, as I shall be next week, it's not a great incite, incitement to studios <laughs> these days. So I'm, 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 I've just written an, an, a new book, which is just out. Just oh, nice. Last Post. Um, and I'm writing another book, which will come out next year. And I've got another one planned for the one after. So well, it depends. When, books. You, know, you never know when they're going to put the scissors in. Right. Until then, <laughs> you keep writing. The, the, these are works of fiction? Yes. Nice. But, uh, the, the, one, the present one is not a work of fiction. It's a number of letters to people, including Stanley Kubrick mm. and Stanley Donnan and so on. And the next book is another one about God help us Jews and stuff. And then I have a novel to write after that. And yeah, I, and like for my audience out there, because I know this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go check out Eyes Wide Open, which is probably available everywhere. And I think you might enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's probably, look, it's a very special account of Stanley Kubrick at the, you know, at the end of his life, right? So it's a, it's a very, very uh, interesting uh, topic that I can't wait to dig into, but Frederick, once again, sir, thank you so much for your time and My pleasure. look forward to continuing our dialogue over. You bet. Why not? All right. All okay. right. Cheers, sir. Bye. Thank you very much.